We're in Titus chapter 3. And I have <clears throat> titled this today, Doing Good, because it makes me think of the question we, we keep coming back to in our own lives, and that is, what is it God wants of me? Uh, what, for some of us, what's the bare minimum? I mean, what do I need to do to get God off my back, make him happy, and <clears throat> stop making me feel guilty? Really? Honestly? Yeah. Come on, be, be truthful with yourself. If you think about God at all, that's what you think. What do I have to do? What are the main requirements? Well, you know, God's told us things like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He told you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. We read those things and we say, nah, that's not it. <laughs> There's got to be something else. There's got to be some do and don't list. Don't do this, do do that. Let's take a look at Titus 3, 1 through 8, because you're going to see the heart of the gospel message here. The whole reason there is Christianity in the first place, you're going to see in this passage today. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 to begin. Titus 3, 1 and 2. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceful and considerate, and also, always, to be gentle toward everyone. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word this morning, we pray your spirit would open our minds, open our hearts, help us to see what's here, help us to know what you want. Teach us, we pray, so that we might live a peaceable life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, this little short epistle letter was written to Titus, who was an assistant of the Apostle Paul. Paul sent him to the island of Crete to put the churches there in order, to set things straight, to teach what they ought to be teaching, and to tell them, no, you shouldn't be doing that. And so when he comes to chapter 3, and he says, remind the people, he's just continuing his list of do's and things that he has for Titus to do. His Titus do list. So remind the people. Here's some things they need to be remembering. Be subject to rulers and authorities. Be obedient. Be ready to do whatever is good. Don't slander anyone. Be peaceful. Be considerate. Be gentle. That's not bad. But yet, well, if you've got a Facebook page, you'll know that those things don't come easily. <laughs> Peaceful, <coughs> gentle. No, it's that guy's a jerk and he's ruining the whole world. But I come to the very first thing he says there. Remind them to be subject. The rulers and authorities. Americans don't like that. Be subject. Especially when you don't particularly care for whoever the current govern, government is. Oh, it was okay with that guy, but this one over here, oh, he's evil, he's, he's the devil incarnate. Let me help you out something here. When Paul wrote this to Titus, you know who the emperor was of Rome? Nero. Crazy, Christian-burning Nero. Paul wrote this knowing. He, he wasn't, oh, gee, is Nero a nut? I didn't know that. No. He knew perfectly well what was going on. But let me tell you this. It's just like uh, anything else in your Christian life. This is a choice. It is better for you to be subject than to be subjected. It's better for you to choose to live in a certain way than it is for someone to put a gun to your head and say, you will live this way. Your choice. What are you going to do? And then Paul is just saying, 
All of this is about how Christians as a people ought to be living their daily life. Not grabbing a sword like Peter and chopping off ears because, you know, we got to save Jesus. But to be living a life that's, that's peaceful and not quarrelsome and gentle and getting along with what's going on. Now, there are times when you have to say, I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. I won't do that. But you don't have to be a jerk about it either. Paul's point is that Christians ought to glorify God with how they live. Our lives ought to be a benefit to other people. Not, why does that person live? Let's all find a way to get rid of him. When you live loving God and loving others, you live a life that's doing good, which is what Paul says here. That's the positive side. Being subject, that's something we don't want to hear about. But living a life that's peaceful and not quarrelsome and that's gentle, that benefits other people. That's positive. That's what we ought to be doing. And what does that do? It makes people look at us and go, well, maybe they really do believe what they say. Maybe it isn't just about me getting what I can get. Slander no one. Wow, that's interesting. Negatively means we're not supposed to harm other people. But positively, there's a good thing in that also. That we ought to be standing for the truth and saying the truth about people even if we don't particularly like them. The medical profession has a ethic. And the ethic is stated in these words. Do no harm. Now what that means is this. If you come into the doctor and you are all destroyed and eaten up either by a disease or you've been in some sort of accident, you're all ripped up, the doctor looks at you and says, there is not a thing I can do for this person to make them any better. The least that person can do is not make you any worse. That's what do no harm means. If you can't help them, at least don't make them any worse. And I would say that for this in your Christian witness, in your Christian life. If you're talking to someone about your faith and you can't help them, the least you can do is not turn them further away from God. No, don't leave them. In, leave a little goodwill for the next witness that comes along. That is a good Christian ethic, I believe, to follow. Don't slander people. Don't trash people. You know what? There are some people that I don't like. And I'm the pastor. But I'm also a human, just like you. And there are people that rub me the wrong way. And you may not have noticed this about me, but I can be sarcastic. I find it easy and desirable to say clever things about others. <laughs> this is written to me. Don, read it in. Okay. Verse 3. Because in other words, don't slam anyone, be peaceful and considerate, gentle, verse 3, because at one time, we too were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. It brings me back to my first question. What does God want? What do I need to do to make God happy? And verse Four and five sums it all up. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we'd done, but because of His mercy. So, 
When you ask the question, what does God want? He wants you to turn to Him. Does He want me to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J? No, because it's not because of righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy. Now here's the hardest thing you will ever do, and I don't know if any of us will completely do it in this life. You must separate what you do from why you're saved. You're saved because of God's grace, not because of things you do. But he turns right around and tells us, tell him to do good. So you have to separate those two. And I'll tell you this over and over again. This will be the main part of my preaching for the rest of my life. You'll hear it all the time. And you and me, the moment we go out there and stub our toe and say something nasty, we're going to think God's mad at us. That is part of the human condition. We're fallen, and immediately when we sin, we think, that means God hates me now, or God's going to punish me now. You need to separate what you do from why you're saved, because you're not saved by what, because of what you do. So, remember your own past. Uh, I, I was a big jerk. I'm less of a jerk now, but I was a real big jerk. It's easy to find jerks if you look for them. They're everywhere. And you can look around and go, oh, what a jerk. Oh, what a jerk. And the fact is, Paul is saying, think about yourself. What, what were you like? Oh, yeah. I mean, you weren't always saved and living righteously, were you? Some of us were worse than the jerks out there that we point at. Beware the tendency... To claim grace for yourself and deny it to other people. Now, let me give you an example. My first church up in the Sierras, we had this hard-nosed sinner. He just wouldn't repent. No, he was not going to believe that religion stuff. And then one day, he became a believer. He turned his life over to the Lord. And the first thing that he did when he gave his life up was he stopped smoking. Fine. That's, that's a good thing, health-wise. But, he could not, this guy was, he's my age now, he's in his 50s. This guy had no grace after that for other people who smoked. They're going to go to hell, God's going to judge him, he's going to kill him with cancer. And he, he had, Listen, pal, how long did you smoke? He just couldn't find any grace for those. You would think a guy like that would have compassion. But it's human nature to hate the sins that you've left behind. Beware. Watch out for yourself. Now, I said it before, I'll say it again. Verses 4 through 6 is the definition of grace. Let me read those again. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we'd done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. It's not of our good works, it's of His mercy. But look at what's going on here. Number one, God affects salvation. You don't make salvation. You don't earn salvation. God does it. And God does it not because of your good works, but because of his mercy. It's because, here's a secret, this will help you, he loves you. There's no hidden ulterior motive or anything else. He loves you. And because he loves you, he desires the best for you. And what he does is, when you turn to him, when you surrender your life to him, he saves you by rebirth, being born again through Jesus. He pours out the Spirit on you to give you his own power in your life to live for him. Now, you may have noticed, if you're a Christian, yes, I, was, I became a believer, yes, uh, I was baptized, yes, the Holy Spirit came upon me, and really, I... I do see the world differently now, but 
I still keep sinning. Yes. Because you have two natures in you now. You have your old nature and you have the new nature. And Paul says they're always going to be warring within you. And what happens is when you sin, it's very easy to go, oh, well, I guess I really don't have the Holy Spirit. I guess, or, or worse, oh, God, please. I've confessed this sin, I don't know how many hundreds of times, and I keep doing it again. I must not really be saved. Stop that. Because it's not about works. God didn't save you and say, well, I'll forgive 999 sins, but the thousandth one, forget it. That's it. It's not about works. Not about works. Keep your eye on the ball. We're called to do good. But, good works don't save us. So what does that mean? It means we do good works because they're good. Because they help people. Because we're thankful to God. Because our new nature wants to glorify God. But it's completely divorced from our salvation. It's a result of our salvation. It's like... Have you ever been in this situation where you you were really tempted to do something and you said, no, I'm not going to do it. And you stood against it and you didn't do it. And then you were just a little bit disappointed that the sky didn't roll back and an angel yeah. choir sing the hallelujah chorus just because of how wonderful you are. We ought to do it because it's right, not because of the reward. We already got something far greater than God saying, Oh, good boy, here's a doggy biscuit. We don't do what we're doing in the hope of putting God in a good mood. He already loves you. Salvation is by grace, through faith, not a result of work so that no one can brag about it. That's right there. That is the heart of Christianity. That's why we come here to worship. That's why we sing songs. That's why we band together. That's why we support one another. Because Jesus saved us by his grace. And that's it. And because of that, we desire to live a life that glorifies him. Verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. There he goes right back to that good work stuff. But this is what he's been saying through this whole letter to Titus. This statement is true. I'm telling you this is something you need to be teaching these people, Titus. It's back to Titus's reason for being there in the first place. Here are the things to stress. And when he says here are the things to stress, right up there is how God saves us by grace. Grace, <coughs> and God wants us to live godly lives. Mike Warnke said one time, <coughs> in church it's always, don't do this, 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 don't do this. He said, I read the Bible. And I saw that there's a whole lot more do's than there are don'ts. And I figure, he says, if you spend your time doing the do's, you don't have time to do the don'ts. That's helpful. If you're living for the Lord, you're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to sin. It's just like riding a bicycle. You get back up. You pat yourself down. Get all the dust off you. You get back on the bicycle and you get going some more. You're going to fall. It's not the end of the world. When you're seven years old and learning how to ride a bike, it's the end of the world. But you notice those cruel parents of yours make you get back up on that stupid bike that's so scary. And suddenly, you're knowing how to do it. That's life. If it works in your regular everyday life, why wouldn't it work in your everyday spiritual life. He says, do this, direct those who've trusted in God. And that brings me to this question. Have you? You can't live God's grace until you receive God's grace. 
You can't receive God's grace until you recognize I'm fallen. I'm separated from God. I'm running around doing my own thing, living a life that's totally opposed to God. It's full of me, 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 and I want to do this, and who cares about you? We call that sin. You can't receive God's grace until you confess that and say, God, please forgive me. And then you find out that God's grace is based on his mercy and not on your works. And it's a little bit confusing because everything in life is based on works. You turn in your paper, you get a pat on the head. You get a good grade or a bad grade. You go to work and show up and you get a paycheck. Woo! Based on works. But salvation is not. And then he turns around and says, do good works. That's a little bit confusing. But again, keep your eye on the ball. We ought to do those things because they're right, not for any other reason. And Paul finishes out this section saying, these things are profitable for everybody. He's not just spouting religious words. This is not just written so that you can sit in church and feel holier than Swiss cheese. It's intended to show you your own need and to whet your appetite for salvation. Eternal life is a great profit for those who believe. I'll say it again. You can't live God's grace until you receive it. You can't receive it until you confess your need. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your words, and not mine, would speak to our hearts today. Touch us, Lord. Draw us near to you. And I pray for anyone who's struggling here today with these concepts, that they wouldn't get hung up in what I said, but that they would see your word and what you said. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.